Hello, everybody. Welcome to our podcast, Awakening Together. I trust you're all doing well. Good to see you. Great. So let's start. Uh, Along the way, maybe you'll have some questions. Maybe you have some questions now about your path of awakening or anything related to your meditations, your awakening, really anything. Uh, If you do, just type it in the box and that will give us some direction to talk about today. While you're thinking of things, I will just pick up where we left last time. Um, Lynn had asked me what it was like to be awakened. And awakening is a process. That's how I experience it. I talked a, a lot about it. What has happened is as different blocks have melted away, I start to feel my being more fully. Uh, and it feel and I feel creation around me more fully or the world around me more fully, and it feels like joy. So I feel constant joy. I also at the same time feel any unresolved blocks that I haven't fully taken care of yet. So I can feel joy and pain and suffering. But there's always the fundamental joy at all times. Joy and light and um, happiness, well-being. When I look at things, they strobe in and out of existence like a let's say a thousand times, a million times a minute, I just see a, it's like a strobe light and things come in and out of existence so fast you can hardly see it, but I do see it all the time. And I also see the light that everything else is made of all the time. It glows. It's, it's all the same thing. Your being is the same as my being, is the same as the tree or... Uh, the grass or anything else that's manifested um, because it's all made of consciousness. So I don't mean it just the tree has consciousness. I also mean it's made of consciousness and you can see it. You're made of consciousness and you experience consciousness, both things. The creation is the flip side of the infinite. Everything manifested is the infinite that's been slowed down and condensed into an object. So you can see that. You can experience that. And I do. All the time. Somebody also asked way back about intuition. What could they do to um, develop their intuition? And what I said back then, which I'll add right now, is as you as your blocks or the things that are deluding you melt away, there's just oneness. And when you're one, you feel everything. And that's called intuition. That's the word we use for intuition. If the person next to me is feeling something, I can feel it because we're the same to the degree that my separation is melted. We're we're all one. So what would be a good practice for developing your intuition? I would say meditate every day. Sit still and let the silt melt out. Let the dirt melt out. Uh, And by dirt, I mean those things that are blocking you. Let Let them melt out of your system. Let them settle. Even if they don't melt out, they can settle down on the ground because, you know, doesn't it make sense? We are everything. So your being is always there. That's who you are. If you let go of everything, you would still be here. That's your being. So that's happiness, well-being. That's also intuition. It's oneness. It's deep trust because you are everything. So, of course, you trust everything. 
But at the same time, anything that's unresolved is still there. It's unresolved. So you feel that too. So in the process of awakening, you feel all of it more and more and more. You start blocking out things less and less and less. You spend less energy blocking out stuff that you don't want to feel. And you just start to feel more and more everything, everything, everything. Poof. Now you've got intuition. Poof. Uh, now you're seeing light and you're experiencing love and well-being. You just also experience that which is left to resolve. And in this opening, you connect to everything. So I did a podcast on connection a while back. And if any of you haven't listened to the podcast, they're, they're on every platform under Awakening Together, and they're on Insight Timer. So you can listen to all of them. And um, they're sequential, although you can listen to anyone all by itself. Amanda says, I keep thinking of questions, but then I know the answer before I finish typing. <laughs> Is this being awake? Yes. Yes, Amanda, that's one. You know, awakening is everything. And as you melt more blocks away, you'll find that you do know everything. You really do. I think I told you I was with my guru and I was also Jesus appeared to me and all these different things. Well, I went through a long period. I'd say started maybe 10 years ago. It still continues. But for about 10 years, I didn't talk to any of them. They told me not to talk to them. They said, don't talk to us. <laughs> Even Jesus, don't talk to us. Why? Because the answers are within. And if I keep trying to reach and get it from somebody else, maybe I don't listen to myself. So there is a happy medium, of course. They only told me that after I'd asked a million and one questions already. And I had advanced already far enough that I wasn't going to crash into a wall and burn. It was very painful, but all the questions are within me and they're within you, Amanda. So it's an interesting phenomena. You get ready to ask a question and then suddenly the answer is in your head. It appears. You could still ask it if you want and just check out to see if it you know, triangulate, say, hey, does this other person have the same experience as I do? That doesn't mean everything, but it is something. Um, but that more and more, you, you'll trust yourself. And that is awakening. Awakening is full trust and full knowing. Because we're, we're really in a hypnosis. Uh, a hypnosis that we don't know. That we have to rely on somebody else to tell us. And for a time, that is true. We're so blocked, we don't know. But, you know, often the person that we ask, they, they don't know either. They just read more books than we have. And although the answers may be in books, what we talk about here is through direct experience. Yes, I reference books. But when I say that I can see the universe strobe in and out of existence, that's not from a book. <laughs> I see it. So when people ask me questions, just like as they ask you questions, Amanda, and you open up more and more and more, it's like you're looking at it. You're experiencing the answer. So they may have read some other book that was a little off kilter and they might go, well, that book says this or that and that's wrong what you just said. Well, it's like you're looking at it. You're experiencing it. So you go, no. I think the place where the book went off track might have been here or here or here. And you can speak that way because you're actually seeing and experiencing the answers. Um, it's like looking at a tree. Somebody could say, well, the, the leaves on it are green. And you could say, no, well, they're green in the spring, but right now they're yellow. 
they're not green because I'm looking at that tree. (laughs) So, yes, you have the answers within you. Now, another good reason to ask a question, though, is it gives us something to talk about and what else are we doing? (laughs) So, any of you, don't make what I just said as, thank you, Amanda. Amanda says, I like that. And finish my sentence to uh, don't don't let what I just said discourage you from asking questions like, oh, now I'm asking questions. So that means I don't know or I'm cutting myself off. No, we're just playing. We're having a good time. We're talking. Right. And if you don't ask questions, you can't talk. We can't talk. So it's just the nature of what we're doing right now. But when you're on your own. Before you ask a question to somebody else, uh, stop for a while. Trust that you know the answer and give it some time to appear because it will drop down from the sky. (sighs) That's an analogy, of course, or a metaphor. Uh, I will tell you something strange. The first time I went to India, I had such profound experiences And when I got back, a very strange thing started to happen for a while. I would have a thought, especially, and it would have a word in it that I hadn't heard for like 20 years. It was a a very unusual word. It wasn't one particular word. It was just a variety of words. And it, it felt like it wanted to come out of my mouth. And for some reason, I wouldn't say that word. I just said, no, I'm not doing it. It was like a weird word. And when I wouldn't say it, almost every time within five minutes, somebody would have a sentence with that crazy word in it. (laughs) It was like it did drop out of the sky and it was going to come out of somebody's mouth. One way or the other. It was very strange. This went on for about two weeks. I remember my little nephew. We were sitting for dinner, and I was not going to say whatever this word was. Supercalistic, fragilist, whatever. Some crazy word. No real substance to it, but just crazy. So I didn't say it. I just said, I'm not doing this. Suddenly, my little nephew is at dinner, and this crazy word comes out of his mouth. Over and over. Let's see. Lynn says, hi, William and everyone. Can you talk about how I can better release the monkey mind? I have such a hard time following my thoughts. Yes, Lynn, that's such a good question. Lynn, you ask, all of you ask great questions. Thank you. Um, First of all, there is no quick answer to that question. Because what the monkey mind is... Let's look at it for a second. It's a lot of thoughts going this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. Um, Amanda says, in your last podcast, you talked about making your own God. Is there a value in finding people with a similar view of God, or does it just strengthen the delusion that your God is the right one? Okay, that's another good question. I'll finish with Len's question. The the print's real tiny here, so that's why I jump in, just to read it to make sure it's not what everybody's asking. But Lynn, as far as the monkey mind, if you look at your thoughts, they're always fueled by an emotion. I'm nervous. I'm scared. How do you know what the emotion is? Don't let yourself think the thought. And And very quickly, you'll feel the emotion that's behind the thought. Like, I'm not going to think. Then suddenly you might start to feel anxious. Like, what do you mean? I I can't think. I mean, that's another thought. You don't even have that. Just stop thinking by willpower. Uh, You'll feel anxiety or something. And if you sit still enough, that thought is basically frozen anxiety or hurt or anger. Looking for a solution. Solution for what? For the emotion underneath it. So as you sit, that thought can start to melt. As it melts away, it reveals the emotion underneath it. 
anxiety or anger or fear or something, anger, hurt. Um, now, as that melts away, as you sit long enough and that melts away, you're going to find a tension underneath that. It's actually in your body. You'll, find a you'll feel a tension. Now, that tension is where you started to separate from yourself and go up into your head. Your emotions, remember, are hallucinations. So are your thoughts. They're hallucinations. We make them up. That's how they can melt away, and we're still there. We, we craft them. Um, so you'll find a tension. When, when you put your attention on that tension, that just doesn't go away all by itself. It releases lots of energy when you keep it in awareness and consciousness, and that's good. But it, there's a second step. That tension itself, that's a part of you that's twisted off and put to the side. It's like a repression. And it itself needs to breathe in the qualities of your being, which are the same as the qualities of creation and consciousness, love, peace, well-being. So you find that in yourself first. And if you can't find it, find it in nature. If you can't find it in yourself, find it in nature. If you can't find it in nature, find it in a painting. Find it in art. Find it in music. Find it somewhere. And let that tension, and if you can't get to the tension, let the emotion, and if you can't get to the emotion, let the thought breathe in. That whole complex, in other words, let it begin to breathe in. Let it receive what it's looking for, and that's peace and relaxation and resolution. It doesn't have to have intellectual resolution necessarily, although that can be helpful. It wants um, infinite resolution, um, coherence with the universe, oneness, a, a feeling of, and an understanding that all is okay. So when it breathes that in and it soaks it in, it can start to dispel release and relax. And when it does, that whole complex of that portion of the monkey mind disappears. Now, there may be still three or four. Uh, they're like trees. You know, they have roots and uh, branches and leaves. But there might be three or four or five actual trunks and roots systems. And as one melts away, there still may be four more. But then as another one melts away, there's still now there's only three more and it starts to slow down and feel better. The reason why it's difficult, though, is we get so captured, just like we do with our TV programs, we get so captured in the drama of our hallucinations. We forget to just sit still and let them go and let them dissolve because we want to know how do they come out? How do they resolve themselves? What do they do? We're interested. We're on the edge of our seat. If I think this, if I do that, if I do this, if I change that habit, if I do that, well, we get so captivated, we don't let the thing melt. And in that captivation, we utilize it more fully and make it stronger. So that's the, what humans often do because we're so, quote unquote, as they say in India, deluded. And they don't mean that in a bad way. They just mean we're cut off from ourselves. We're looking through a lens that is not accurate. And therefore, everything we see is um, not accurate. Like Einstein said, the mind that creates the problem cannot solve it. So... The problem's coming from a place that's created it, which is coming from a place that's separated off from itself. So the short answer is you have to sit still and let it settle out. Sure, there are other practices, and if sitting still doesn't work, find another practice that does. But the most powerful one is to sit still. Why? Because then you can see all the stuff that's trying to pull you away and you can let it dissolve. You're not tempted to get so involved in the middle of it. If you're if you're in the middle of life's drama, walking around, you're talking, you're you're interacting with people. There's no way you can you're you're captivated by it now. You got to wait until you can extract yourself and let this stuff melt away. 
in the final analysis, you've got to become more captivated with loving yourself than you love your thoughts. I'm talking a lot about this, Len, not because of you. It's, I mean, you asked the question, and this is a common human experience, but everybody experiences this. So that's why I'm spending so much time on it. And for uh, those of you that haven't, uh, again, the podcasts um, go through all of this a lot. So just review those. Uh, now, I hope that answers or starts to answer your question, Lynn. If there's something I haven't touched on or a different angle, just type that in and I'll get back to it. Amanda, you, you talked about, um, you said um, in my last podcast, I talked about making your own uh, God. Is there a value to finding people with similar view or does that just strengthen the delusion that your God is the right one? Um, no, that, no problem with your typos, Amanda. Amanda said, sorry for her typos. Uh, phone, <laughs> typing on the phone. Um, well, here's the thing. This is a bit of an unusual subject. I did talk about it in my last podcast. I told you all that as a child, I used to pray every night to Jesus and to God. And I was a child. So I completely trusted that my prayers would be answered. And they were because I had complete trust. There was no blockage. It was just the, the power of a child, a child's heart. And you've all remember being a child in your heart. And when you would connect to something very powerful, or you connect to a child now, very powerful. So it moves the universe. And then later, I talked about in a recent podcast how Jesus came to me um, and talked to me and showed me so much love in real life. But what Jesus knows, and what you know, and what every, you don't get, Jesus said the Father and I are one, oneness. That, that meant no Jesus. He got killed because people thought he was blaspheming, doing blasphemy, <laughs> um, like I am God. He didn't say that. What he meant is, I have disappeared into God in complete devotion. Only God is left. And he was such a clear channel that miracles happen. This is true. It wasn't special of him. He said everybody after him will do what he did and greater. Or not everybody, but those that there would be people that would do what he did and greater. Um, he would, if somebody would give him a compliment and he's, they'd say, good teacher, he said, who... I'm not good. God is the good. There is no me. Everything good comes from the infinite, from God. Well, in oneness, when you connect to God, there's only one God. There, there's only one God. And when you connect to that God, it's beyond even God. God is a manifestation in our creation. Let's, I feel much more comfortable with the word infinite. And I don't even feel fully comfortable with the word infinite because it's beyond everything in creation as well. So that is nothing because only things exist that are in creation. Our limited minds can't comprehend what's beyond creation because we can only comprehend what we know. So you can't comprehend something that doesn't exist, yet everything comes from it. How, you know, how do you describe that? Well, it's the same with our conception of God because that's in creation. 
So we go beyond even a conception of God. But in my podcast, I said, you know, you create your own God because you find, because you need an entryway into the infinite. And if you have a God, if you're, if you're afraid of a mean God, one that hasn't learned to forgive people and will burn you in hell and fire and burn such stone and it's got an attitude, don't worship that God because you'll be shut down. And just like in First John, John says, um, perfect love casts out fear. And then he goes on to say, fear is, to paraphrase him, that's you shutting down and be separating from the love of God. Fear is you shutting down. So do not worship a God, an image of God that shuts you down. Um, if you've been abused by a man and you're scared of men, do not worship a, a male God. Do not do that. I don't see how that's going to be helpful. See, the infinite doesn't care what our little minds, it's just, because what are we talking about? Oneness, and that's connection. It doesn't matter how you connect. It All that matters is that you do connect fully and completely. It doesn't hurt the infinite's feelings, which, by the way, is you. <laughs> That's awakening when you let your stuff go. That's what Jesus did. The Father and I are one. He wasn't quibbling around, well, me, little Jesus, I got my feelings hurt, and, how, you know, I need to... How did Jesus deal with the Bible of his time, uh, called the Law and the Prophets, or the Tanakh, which also included the... Um, wisdom literature, they had a death penalty for adultery. With the adulterous woman, he just picked up a stone and said, hey, you without sin cast the first stone. He said, no. He let it go. So he was not bound to any kind of temporal thing. Sabbath, death penalty. If you break the Sabbath, he said, how many of you would go out and save one of your sheep on the Sabbath if it was lost? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He chucked all that out. Not because it was, quote unquote, as we say, these, as Christians say, the Old Testament. No, no. He didn't know anything about a New Testament. That happened minimally 40 years after he died. He, he had, no, he w it was the literature, the religious uh, scriptures of his time. He just, he stuck with himself, his heart. So Lynn, I'm get, I mean, Amanda, I'm giving you a long answer, but the answer is find a portal to the infinite that works for you. Whatever opens your heart, don't get stuck in that place if you evolve past that portal, just like Jesus evolved past his portal. He was Jewish. He evolved past it. Um, don't get stuck there. But sure, being with people of the same mind, you know, Buddha said Sangha was very important. He said... Um, Teachings, right teachings, right teachings were important. Knowing your Buddha nature was important and being with people that could support you was very important. So um, be with people, a support system. Very important. It doesn't strengthen your delusions only if you get very... Um, mental about it, <laughs> you know, like, look deeper. Uh, all religions only point to something deeper. It's not the religion itself. They're helpful, just like all spiritual practices are helpful, but they're not the experience of oneness. They're just helpful avenues for you to experience oneness, just like Buddha and Jesus and Krishna and everybody else. Okay. 
I hope that helps type in a little bit more if I if I kind of skirted around and didn't answer. I tried, but maybe I didn't. Marty says, what helped me the most with struggling with the God question was having a profound experience in meditation. Yes. I felt this love pour in to and out of every cell of my body. Yes. Words don't do it justice. I was one with everyone and everything, roots, trees, people. Yes. I have come to believe God is infinite loving consciousness. Yes. Trouble is I can't get anyone to understand. I understand it, Marty. Um, we all walk our own path, I guess, and people have to get there on their own. Anyway, it changed my life and opened my heart. I finally love myself, which is the best gift I've ever received. Well, that's beautiful, Marty. Enough said. I mean, that is the absolute truth of it. I bet a lot of people here understand what you're saying, what you experienced, actually. And that's the difference from talking and experiencing. You experienced, and that's so beautiful. That's my experience, too. It's all of our experience if we just sit down long enough and let stuff settle out. Um, Angie gives thumbs up to Martin. And uh, Amanda says, that's perfect. It's the situation of looking at the hand instead of where it's pointing. Yes, Amanda, and we're back to talking about Amanda's question, which is, uh, getting stuck with a concept of God. Yes, God is an image. That word is just a label, right? <laughs> it's just a label. If you stop at the label, you stop. You trust your heart. And that's what Buddha and Jesus and everybody talked about. That's what uh, Marty's talking about. Amanda says, thank you, Marty. See, Marty, that... I love it when you guys uh, say stuff. Um, and I love your questions, Lynn, Amanda, your comment, Marty. This is available to everyone. I, I trust everybody listening in knows that. And if you don't, I'll, I'll say it. Marty just said it. This is the, available to everyone. Nobody spent. You don't worship Jesus to for him to take care of stuff. You know, back in the um, early days, in the nomadic days, the the Habiru, it was a uh, tribe out in the desert. We we later called them the Hebrews, but it, they were called the Habiru. And all the surrounding people, they had a, a practice, most of them, that if they made a very bad mistake and they knew they had to pay for it, but they didn't want to, they would kill something else and say, well, that paid for it. I, I will kill the fatted calf and that will atone for me. I'm sorry, but I don't want to die, but we'll, we'll kill the, the calf and eh, we'll eat it too. Maybe we'll cook it up, but we'll offer it to God. Other times they would also say, no, 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 too sacred. We just offer it to God. We won't even eat it. But they would atone. And, um, you know, later they said, well, that's what Jesus did. He got killed and he atoned for all of us. Well, I don't know. It was the practice. Jesus, uh, it was the culture of the day. And we do get locked into our viewpoints. But Jesus did just what all of you are doing. He had troubles. He had the lost years. I think there were about 18 years in the Bible where you don't see what happened to him. And he says, I went out into the desert and I had all sorts of stuff come up. He sat still. He felt his junk. It hurt. It felt terrible. And any of you that have meditated for any set period of time, it's hard to sit still. People would rather do anything but sit still, mostly. 
It's painful because you can't repress stuff when you sit still. Well, he, all of his stuff came up, and you can read about it, and it was horrible. Felt like Satan was attacking him. But after that, what happened to Marty was what happened to Jesus. He could see clearly. His stuff burnt away. And it's true for every single one of you and me. This is the human experience. Period. We are one. We're, we're like the infinite comes through us. And as we let go, there's only the infinite, just like Marty described. The infinite around us and through us. And we disappear. Don't be freaked out if that happens and then your mind comes back and it cuts you off again. And you, Because often people will say, oh, I lost it. I lost it. No, you didn't lose it. What happened was there's still some unresolved stuff that is now coming forward to dissolve. And while it's coming forward before it has dissolved, it's so thick that it feels like I'm disconnected from myself and the infinite. But it's just that there's still more to let go of. What else y'all thinking about these days? While you're thinking about maybe a thought or a comment, you know, all this for all of us is very strange, right? Suddenly there's a miracle. I bet Marty, when you're sitting there meditating, then boom, you're like, what the heck? This is amazing. I'm love and everything else around me is love. Wow. I'm experiencing that. I bet you're like me. I bet you were a little bit shocked. In a good way. I mean, just like, wow. Just what they said. Just what I've read about. Just what I've heard. It is true. Uh, miracles, when they happen in your life, as they have for me and probably many of you, you don't expect them. You don't try to have them. They just, boom, it happens. And I say that because I, I had another strange thing that just started happening this week. I like to get up early in the morning and walk on the beach. I get up about five o'clock and it's pitch black. So I'm walking down the beach and I walk for two or three hours every morning. And it's pitch black. And about, I guess about three days ago, suddenly I got hit with a beam of light. There was light everywhere. It was very bright. And I turned around, it, like, because sometimes there's another person out there and it's so dark, they have a flashlight, a high-powered flashlight. And I thought somebody had hit me with their halogen light. Or maybe there was um, headlights, because it's there's a road in the distance. Maybe powerful headlights. And I looked around and it was pitch black. There was nothing back there. I kept walking and boom, again, bright light. I turned around, nothing, black, bright light. Today, I, this morning, I'm walking. Nothing, it's just black, it's fine, <laughs> no problem. Because <laughs> I don't really focus on it. But then suddenly, boof, flashes of bright light again. Um, we are light. We talk about that. It's true. We're light. As you sit down and meditate, it's just not so strange in a way. It both is strange and not strange to be who you are. <laughs> you don't mean to. You don't try to. <laughs> it's just that when you sit down long enough, the stuff settles out and then you start to experience what's underneath all the crust. Uh, Marty says, um, from he, he typed this a little while back. He said, yeah, all the stuff, quote unquote, stuff is tough. I had to do a lot of shadow work. Yes, good for you. Oh, my God, I was crying profusely. I had no idea that kind of love existed. Yes. 
Wow. I understand, Marty. Um, I love that you did a lot of shadow work. Um, I've got a um, podcast coming up soon on uh, psychotherapy. Psychotherapy isn't awakening, but not good. It doesn't help to overlook obvious things and let them go. And however you do it, it, whether it's formal psychotherapy or any other way, shadow work is very helpful. And yes, you are that infinite love. And that crying profusely is you re not reuniting with that's just you experiencing yourself and you had no idea you were like that. And as Jesus would say, he'd say, what do you mean you are like that? There is no you. It's only God. And that's what I mean too. God as you. Pure love. Gary says, so you could feel a connection with God and then feel a disconnection again because of unresolved issues or emotions absolutely see there is only one and it's not a matter of you don't go away the one you're always there you're being let's call it that you know it gets tricky when we're trying to converse as humans but there, you're always there, or we could say God is always there. There is no you. There's only God. Yogananda says it's not right to say I am God. Better to say God is me. God has become me. There is no me. But when you jump back, it's like all things in life. You do, Something starts to happen. You don't necessary after like years and lifetimes of habits of looking the other way it's not suddenly after one experience they're all gone just because i awaken doesn't mean now i can speak german if i need to speak german i have to learn to speak german just because i'm awakened doesn't mean if i had a rock in my pocket the day before and i didn't take it out that the rock is gone I, to get the rock out i have to take it out just because I'm awakened, if my psychology is like a rock in my pocket and it's blocking me, just because I became awake doesn't mean my psychology is fixed. I have to do something. Gary, I mean, Marty went and did some shadow work, probably still doing some. Because it's a matter of you just keep cleaning and cleaning and letting go and letting go and becoming what you are. See, there's a lag time. The personality is just a shell. It expresses what you are. And when I thought I was hurt, fear, and anger, um, it reflected that. It takes a while, like a large ship, to turn around and to reflect love, peace, and well-being that I am. So... Um, Amanda says, Gary, that has been my experience. There's a story about a traveler who builds a raft to cross a lake, then realizes he cannot keep it to climb the next mountain. We need different things at different stages. Beautiful, Amanda. Yes, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, all of our practices, they help get us across the river. Our experiences give us glimpses. Our experiences aren't really a practice like our experience that Marty shared about experiencing the infinite love. That's not a practice. That's just that's a clear seeing of who he is. But practices help get us to these clear seeings. But we got to let them go. And just like our concepts of God. Doesn't mean they're wrong or anything. It's just they're a portal and we go beyond. Jesus didn't stick at the Jewish conception of God. He went, he disappeared so completely. God was him. He experienced God. He didn't think about God. He experienced God. Big difference. 
So yes, Amanda, that's a beautiful story. Gary says, I understand like layers. Yes, it's like layers. That's how I experience it too. And as one layer goes, as it dissolves, another layer um, comes up. The next deeper layer comes up. But I start to feel myself more and more and more, more and more consistently through the day as more and more layers are gone. Just like you, Gary. Marty says, and let's not forget the ego. It can cause a lot of suffering if you are unaware of it. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, Marty, so true. The ego, um, how we view ourselves That's where we get trapped. It's just a hallucination. It's like I used to work a lot with hypnosis as a psychotherapist. And if somebody, let's say they, I did a stage show and that's not typically what I did. I did working with anxiety and stuff like that with my hypnosis. But let's say I was doing a stage show and I told somebody there were a chicken uh, and they believed they were a chicken. It would create a lot of suffering for them. You know, as they walk through life, they were they'd be afraid people would want to eat them and cook them and it'd be terrible. It's true with any viewpoint. It's just a hypnosis. Now, in in real hypnosis, people do believe they are chickens at (laughs) times. At the end of the hypnotic uh, experience, you just dissolve their hypnosis, you say. You ask them to let it go. Uh, Stephen Walensky wrote a book, uh, The Trances People Live. He's a psychologist. And he says, when people come into my office as a psychologist, I don't hypnotize them. They're already hypnotized. I dehypnotize them. Well, that's what the ego is. It's a hypnosis, right? So we dehypnotize ourselves. And they're... uh, Earlier in the series, there I have podcasts on that. So if you haven't listened to those podcasts, you might consider it. Angie says, many, many layers, Gary. Our true nature is buried under a lifetime of learned behaviors, possibly trauma, social conditioning, etc. So true, Angie. So many layers, just like Gary said, and which is interesting, there is a place in the awakening process where it might not seem very spiritual or elegant, but after you've done a lot of work, you do have some of these conditionings and habits. You work on it, you dissolve it, you see through it. You do a lot of things, but at some point when it gets thin enough and you're ready, you just have to say, stop. No. I'm not doing this anymore. No. Stop. That's not, you know, it's not elegant. It's, but it's true. It's an old habit. It's an old momentum. And when it doesn't suit your being anymore, at some point you say, stop. You don't do that early on probably because um, maybe there's a lot of shadow work that still has to be done or a lot of underlying issues that still need to be resolved and just saying stop would be basically like repressing it. But you'll know the difference. When you've done the work and it's just a wisp, but it's still controlling a little bit of your life, your thoughts, you just stop, you let it go. So Angie, yes, Um, a lot of conditioning. You just stop it. (laughs) Marty says, yes, spot on. Uh, Gary, I'm peeling off the skin of the onion and it can be very painful emotionally. Yes, because the skin is made of pain and it does not dissolve. It wouldn't be skin. It wouldn't be repressed if it was happiness, right? We don't repress happiness. We only repress pain. So when it comes to the surface, it's what the, it, the same reason why we, were, we repressed it is still there. It hurts. That's why we got rid of it in the first place. So um, again, go back to earlier podcasts, everybody. If this is of interest to you, we talk about that. Amanda, I second the amazing results of shadow work, yes. Decades of being stuck, melted away on a couple of weeks of consistent work, yes. 
Yes, Amanda, very good. Wow, you guys, wow. Marty, Gary, it's a very painful <laughs> process, but the payoff is amazing. More joy, peace, and love in your life. Oh, my goodness, yes. Mm, 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 mm. You guys. So that's the bottom line. We're all teaching each other. That's the why the name of this podcast is Awakening Together. You are far more awake than I am on certain levels, on some levels. Maybe I've had an experience or two that is helpful for you to hear. But nobody's ahead of anybody. You're all great teachers. Gary says, Marty, that will be awesome. Yeah, I agree with Marty, Gary, that uh, the payoff is amazing. And really, when I was more into my ego, because as... You noted its layers. A lot has melted off for me. It was so painful before. Still got some left. I couldn't have imagined the difference of what life really is compared to my deluded view of what I thought it was. That was reinforced, as Amanda said, by society. Because every what is society? What is culture? It's a cult. It's a lot of people thinking the same thing. And why are they thinking the same thing and reinforcing each other? Because they're all cut off. <laughs> they're all addicted to their thoughts. None of them are seeing their ego. And some are. Some are. Some are. You are. More and more people are. It's been a huge change. Have you noticed? One of my teachers, Bhagavan, used to say, he said, you know, it's going to get really bad when the light comes into the world more because everybody's going to see how bad it always has been for a long time. And it's going to appear like chaos. But it needs to be chaos for the whole thing to break down and release the innate energy that's in society. But it's going to look real bad. It'll get better, but it's going to look real bad. And it will be real bad. So yes to you all. And it is a painful process, but the payoff is amazing. Both on our personal level and on the level of society, our families. Now in family therapy, the first thing you learn is if somebody changes and they want to get better, the rest of the family, unconsciously, they're used to how you used to be. So they fight to keep you from getting well. That doesn't make them bad or mean. It's just 100% of the time that's what happens. Because they're used to when they say something, you say something back in a certain way. And when you quit doing that, it throws them. They don't know, is something wrong? Is something wrong? So they try to push you back into your old way of being. Same with society, our families, everything. But if you stay centered, what happens is the structures around you start to change. Your family starts to change and heal. So stay centered. Angie says, we're waking up and those awake are walking each other home. Yeah, absolutely. Ram Das used to say that a lot. <laughs> Marty says, yes, Angie, Ram Das was right. That's what we are here for. Yeah, Ram Das. What, if, if you all haven't listened to Ram Das, I've met him and he's passed away, and Krishna Das, and Bhagavan Das, and beautiful people. They're, they're a guru, Neem Karoli Baba. But um, you listen to Ram Das's podcast. He's so articulate. You can get them on the Be Here Now network for free, or just maybe Google Ram Das podcasts or something like that. And he's probably got 200 of them. 
Really beautiful. Really beautiful. He's so articulate. Marty says, thanks for all of you being here. And thank you, William. Much love, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for such good questions and all of your heart. Take care, everybody. Bye. Hello, this is William. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing it with somebody else. Send them a link. Thanks so much.